Hi, I'm Gabriel Robbie. I'm an orthopedic surgeon trained in Montreal, Canada. I will be presenting on caliper kinematic alignment technique for TKA. And we'll jump right in. Madame CF is a 66 years old lady who presented to us with bilateral anterior knee pain. X-rays reveal a primarily patellofemoral arthritis with some medial tibiofemoral joint space narrowing. She has a mostly neutral lower limb alignment but does present significant posterior tibial slopes. The left medial slope was measured at 13 degrees. She has a 1 degree valgus arrhythmic HKA but 2 degrees varus pre-op HKA. This would classify her as a neutral apex distal alignment in the CPAC classification. In the Personalized Arthroplasty Society classification, her case is described as a simple KATKA. We proceed with our standard technique. So we proceed with the incision and arthrotomy, which is marked with a sterile surgical marker to be certain that it is closed anatomically at the end of the procedure, that is to prevent any alteration of the normal patella tracking. The fat pad is removed. We only resurface the patella as a last resort measure to improve tracking. Osteophytes are removed, the patella is denervated, the lateral facet is lightly reshaped to optimize engagement in the prosthetic trochlea. Here a scalpel is used to determine the cartilage wear or preservation and decide on cartilage compensation for the femoral cutting guides. The center point of the groove is marked, notch osteophytes are removed, the center point is reassessed. It will be co-aligned with the prosthetic groove center point to determine the medial lateral translation of the prosthesis. The tibial spines are osteomized and the anterior lateral condyle ridge is removed to facilitate AP sizing. The femoral canal is broached and the intramedullary guide is inserted. This is only used to determine the sagittal plane flexion of the femoral component, not the varus valgus. Partially worn cartilage is completely removed and a 2mm compensation integrated into the distal femoral cutting guide is used for the affected condyle. Rotation of the distal cutting guide is set parallel to the posterior condyles and is fixed in place. The essence of the kinematic alignment technique is to effectively resurface the knee. That is to remove the same amount of material as we are implanting. This implant distal condyles are 9mm thick and posterior condyles are 8mm thick. Every cut is thus measured, verified with a caliper to confirm the resected thickness. Posterior condyle cartilage wear compensation can be used if required to reproduce pre-arthritic rotation. Alright, I'm just going to pause this here because this is what makes this technique special. We apply the principles of resurfacing the condyles and tibia to the trochlear groove. Generally, at the level of the anterior chamfer cut where the patella engages, we remove more trochlear thickness than what we put in with a standard flush anterior femoral cut. The thickness of the prosthetic trochlear groove of this implant is only 1.5 mm thick. To optimize patellofemoral offset and tracking, we aim to resect only 1.5 mm of trochlea in the anterior chamfer cut. To do this, we upsize the femoral cutting guide and component by two sizes above the usual flush anterior reference. We can do this only when the medial lateral width of the femur permits upsizing the component while avoiding medial lateral overhang. This is possible in kinematic alignment because KA avoids the typical lateral overstuffing of mechanical alignment and because in full extension the patella is disengaged from the trochlea. A pin or drill bit parallel to the line of the medial femoral trial component can be inserted in the proximal tibia. This can be useful in cases of severe lateral plateau bone loss when we determine the axis of the tibial cutting plane later on. The lateral plateau is exposed and the AP axis is determined as per the diagram. The tibial cutting guide is then positioned parallel to the AP axis of the lateral plateau. This is especially important in patients with high tibial slopes. 
Two styluses on the tibial cutting guide are used to determine symmetric resection of the medial and lateral plateaus, thus setting the varus valgus orientation of the tibia. The angel wing is inserted in the tibial guide to assess the medial tibial slope. Here we can see that it is consciously decreased. The thinnest tibial component and liner combination is 10 mm. If you subtract the 1.5 mm thick curve of the saw, we aim for a tibial cut that is 8.5 mm thick and symmetric. Here the medial plateau was measured at 7 mm and the lateral plateau at 8 mm. We are just undercutting by 1.5 mm on the medial plateau. We confirm with the gap spacer that we are tight medially in flexion and in extension. This mandates a varus recut of the tibia. The tibial recut guide is simply a jig that you press firmly onto your previous tibial cut and that adds 2 degrees of varus or valgus. The tibia is then sized and positioned appropriately. We believe that with a medial pivot design implant that favors posterior lateral rollback, it is particularly important to obtain adequate coverage of the posterior lateral cortex. The restoration of the physiological laxity of the medial compartment is confirmed by feeling the MCL is lax in a resting position and taut when stressed. We proceed with cementation. Cement is pressurized into the tibia in a posterior to anterior fashion to avoid bone marrow seeping under the nozzle of the cement gun. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. We'll be looking at some post-op x-rays now. Feel free to pause the video for a longer look. On the lateral x-ray, you can appreciate that the anterior flange seems oversized. To the very least, it looks bigger than what we are used to with mechanical line. This is a classic aspect of our post-op x-rays when we manage to upsize the component while avoiding distal medial lateral overhang. We've had no anterior knee pain so far with this technique and we're in the process of collecting more data and eventually publishing our results. Although two-dimensional imaging has been shown to be relatively imprecise, we can appreciate on EOS imaging that we've restored the anatomical parameters measured here except for the slope which was consciously decreased. Thank you for your interest and attention. Please do connect with us and move the conversation online so that we can all continue to reflect collectively on improving patient care.